Should you buy a Hyundai i30? Let's live life on the edge and find out. The Hyundai i30 is the other popular small car in Australia. Mazda 3 and Toyota Corolla fight it out for first place in sales, but the i30 is the third placed car. 2014 was a kind of boardroom Bollinger cork popping year for i30 when it overtook the Holden Commodore. Go back eight years before the GFC and tell me you could have predicted that. This video follows up earlier reports on which small car to buy, seeing as Hyundai has upgraded the i30 since then. And it also follows the report from a few weeks ago on how small cars became big. I'll have links to those reports at the end of this one. Part of the reason i30 is a distant third place is Hyundai's idiot savant disinclination to bite the bullet and burn the Elantra badge. Elantra is the i30 sedan, and nobody inside Hyundai can offer a rationally defensible explanation why they're persisting with this meaningless word. This review is brought to you by the Elantra Channel. It's a combination of the word Elan, meaning energy, style and enthusiasm, and the word Tra, which comes before La 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 in 9 out of 10 leading transvestite dance reviews. So glad we cleared that up. Actually, Hyundai has always had a bit of an each way bet on names. Even today, half the range is alphanumeric and the other half uses actual words, some of which are even authentically part of the language. It's confusing. When you add Elantra sales to i30, you can see how close this fight really is. Suddenly, the i30 constitutes a real threat to the top two. One in every 10 vehicles sold in this country today is one of these top three cars. Corolla owners love Corollas. I get that. But it remains one of the world's most boring cars. And that's fine if you want boring. There's a huge market out there for boring. Oh, what a feeling. And Toyota has that cornered. But the Mazda 3 is a very different car as well, the big innovator in the trio. And the desirable ones, like the SP25 Astina, they're pretty expensive and very impressive. Hyundai's i30 kind of hedges its bets and sits in between these two extremes. The principal differences are not really down to dynamics and performance, although there are differences there. We'll get to that. But in the stuff that matters to actual car buyers domain, Hyundai just smashes Mazda and Toyota on warranty. If you're a fleet buyer turning your cars over every 12 months or something, you don't really give a crap about warranty. But if you're a private car buyer who typically owns a car for longer than three years, a five-year warranty is a big deal. It's also a place Toyota and Mazda fear to tread. Furthermore, Toyota's six-month service interval is just embarrassing. There's no underlying need for that. They're doing it just to pump up dealership service department cash flow. Mazda has notional 12-month servicing like Hyundai, but the Mazda 10,000 km distance interval means a service every eight months if you're an average punter. Hyundai is also a clear winner on service, which is bang on once a year, 15,000 kilometres for lifetime capped price services. The other big fail for the Mazda 3 is the Space Saver spare tyre, which is okay for Toshi-san, stuck in Tokyo traffic, but it's ridiculous for Australian driving, flat out ridiculous. Dear Mazda, Space Savers are a friggin' joke in Australia on the freeway, at night, in the rain. They're a safety disgrace. The Toyota Corolla has a CVT, which is fine if your car is just an appliance for, I don't know, getting you to church where you can bother the hell out of God once a week. And there's a social context element here too. If all your friends drive Corollas, you certainly don't want to be the one bad apple turning up in an i30 for a blue rinse and a PIMS. That would be socially irreconcilable 
at the bowling club. If you decide to buy an i30, incredibly enough, there are 16 different flavours on the menu. Just like kimchi. So much choice. In the i30, the selection is permutated by body style, powertrain, and the inevitable different hair and makeup across the specification grades. The biggest hurdle here could in fact be deciding exactly which one you want. And don't take the salesman's advice. He'll typically just try to sell you the one he needs to get rid of, not necessarily the one that's right for you. There's basically two different strains of i30 DNA, the conventional one and the sporty option they call the SR. And they kind of sit in parallel, like North Korea and South Korea, only friendlier. One has toilet paper and a functioning economy, and the other has a mad dictator with a nuclear arsenal and possibly the worst hairdresser on earth. To me, that's just not a hairdo that screams statesman. In order to maximise credibility as a tyrant, Kim Jong-un needs to stop waxing his own eyebrows. He's a dictator, not a vagina. Or is he? In the conventional i30 range, the base model Active is reasonably well equipped, but still not the one you most probably want. It's got steel wheels with those bad taste plastic covers. Hello, 21st century calling? If steel wheels weren't authentically shit, why cover them up with plastic that tries and yet fails to look like alloy? It's about as dignified as a comb over if you've got hair like mine even if you are going to be the 45th and craziest president of the United States. And that's saying something. At least Hyundai has seen fit to make a reversing camera standard across the i30 range, which is going to save lives, even in the cheap seats. And I so hate it when car companies make safety socioeconomic. So it's great that Hyundai hasn't done that. You get cruise control and a trip computer and Bluetooth and a multifunction steering wheel. So i30 Active is not exactly a poverty pack, but it's still a fleet buyer's special. Next step up is the i30 Active X, a smarter choice for private buyers. You get alloy wheels instead of the automotive comb over, plus side mirrors that fold electrically. There's a splash of partly fake leather, and you've got to love partly fake leather, especially if you're a cow. Big sigh of skin retaining relief there. Generally with i30 Active X, you get more premium materials and equipment and it's just 1100 bucks more. So pretty good value. The i30 Premium comes fully loaded and so it would want to because it's gonna knock you back an incredible $12,000 more than the entry-level ActiveX, which is a sizable step up. If you start at ActiveX petrol manual, it's gonna cost you $2,300 for an auto and another $2,300 to step up to the diesel, which also means upgrading from a conventional six-speed auto in the petrol to a seven-speed dual-clutch transmission. And that diesel rocks. It almost matches the petrol on peak power, but its real strength is low RPM torque. 50% more at less than half the revs. So it goes like a locomotive in the mid-range. Mathematically then, premium equals diesel engine plus dual clutch transmission plus about 7,000 bucks worth of hair and makeup. Premium i30 really is pimped. It gets bigger alloys, the full high-tech lighting package at each end, big touch screen, Nokia GPS, Proximity key, alloy pedals, electronic park brake, heated and ventilated front seats, dual zone climate control with rear air conditioning vents, the big black glass roof, auto wipers, and a premium knob. Uh, uh, uh. Having a premium knob is like copping an upgrade to business class. Afterwards, it's bloody hard to go back to economy. In the sport-driven domain, there's the i30 SR, and that's in two flavours. You get vanilla and SR Premium. The big news there, a two-litre direct-injected petrol engine with 15% more poke than the 1.8 multi-point petrol from i30 Planet Conventional. 
i30SR also has more power than Mazda's equivalent 2 litre engine in the Mazda 3, but Hyundai revs it harder to get there. So the two engines perform about the same at lower revs. And the i30SR really can't match the 2.5 litre engine in the Mazda 3 SP25. Equipment is very good on the base SR, and the SR Premium is a delightful car. But here's the paradox. i30 SR Premium is going to cost you $1,100 more than a Mazda 3 SP25 GT. And that's something of a philosophical bridge between the brands that you've got to cross. Which is going to be impossible for some people. It'd be easy to struggle with spending more for the hot hatch Hyundai than a sporty Mazda with a more potent engine. I guess in mitigation, the i30 SR Premium has very similar equipment level, plus a better warranty, a full-size spare wheel, cap price service for life, a superior service interval, and all of that beats what Mazda offers. The i30 SR is also a little more refined than the Mazda, thanks to some excellent local tuning on the suspension, and also because it's just better at attenuating road noise. That's a perennial Mazda bugbear, they're just a bit noisy. Another plus is Hyundai doesn't do the equivalent of Mazda's hateful iStop system. iStop being one of the most philosophically reprehensible engineering executions in the universe. On fundamentals, if you want to set the lap record, buy the Mazda 3 SP25. If you want a slightly slower, but ultimately more refined car with better consumer fundamentals, the i30 SR Premium. That's how it plays. There's a pretty neat i30 wagon available too. Hyundai calls it a Tourer, which in my view is like calling a boob job breast augmentation, or a prison a correctional facility. Despite the name though, it's a good thing. It bridges the practicality gap on the way to an SUV, and you can have it with the diesel or an excellent 1.6 petrol with direct injection, which nearly matches the 1.8 on performance and offers astonishingly better fuel consumption. The i30 wagons are manufactured in a completely different factory. Wagons, correction, tourers, come from the Czech Republic. The hatches are South Korean. That's the Korea whose leader doesn't have Fred Flintstone's barber on a retainer. You know. Kim Jong-un vagina brows. Finally, the seven-speed dual-clutch transmission. That term, dual-clutch transmission, it's almost become an automotive red flag. The Quentin Tarantino of transmissions. Seven cogs of Kill Bill-style mayhem and bloodshed. Largely, this is thanks to the spectacular failures in the Ford Focus and Fiesta and every second Volkswagen on the planet. But Hyundai seems to have applied the dual-clutch durability secret sauce. Veloster's had dual-clutch transmissions for some time, apparently reliably, and Hyundai seems not to be experiencing the Night of the Living Dead dual-clutch movie marathon that Ford and Volkswagen rerun back-to-back -back on every day of the week ending in Y. So I really wouldn't worry too much about that transmission in the i30. That's the comprehensive Hyundai i30 positioning guide, an oddly mechanical South Korean Kama Sutra of sorts. Just right if you're thinking about jumping into bed with an i30 and you don't know exactly how to play it. You can contact me online at autoexpert.com.au and I'll help you save thousands getting your rocks off on an i30 at the right price. Don't forget to subscribe for regular updates and leave a comment below. Let me know what you think. I'm John Cadogan. Thanks for watching.